Hey gang, I'm Nikki LaCroce and you're listening to Who the Fuck. And on today's episode, I'm sharing the mic with Leah Elson. And Leah is a clinical development scientist, nonfiction author, and passionate public science communicator who has spent her 14-year career in medical research working in all sorts of fields, really, orthopedics, novel, biotechnology, oncology, and neuroscience, and is also the creator and host of the popular web series, 60 Seconds of Science and Real Science. That's how I first discovered you on Instagram or TikTok. I can't remember which. And you recently released your book, There Are No Stupid Questions in Science, where you leverage your unique brand of humor, artistic talent, and scientific prowess to answer the internet's most curious scientific questions. I did download it on Kindle, and my wife and I have been very excited to tap into that and answer some of our curiosities. So welcome to the show, Leah. Wow, what a hell of an intro. Thank you so much, Nikki. (laughs) I like to talk fast and make sure that there's a lot of content. But when you have such a robust resume, so to speak, um, it really it it challenges me a little bit. I'll be honest. (laughs) I was impressed. Like, I don't think you took a single breath. That's really impressive. (laughs) Well, I'll, I'll Uh, Before we go into your story, I will say that my mother for a very long time, she passed away a couple of years ago. And the thing that irritated me the most that I probably miss now a little bit is that when I would be sharing a story with her, I would go through it in the pace at which you just heard and she would be like, breathe. And then be like, (laughs) you just made me lose my spot. And now we have to start over again. And whose fault's that? So um, it does work to my benefit occasionally. (laughs) I get it. Listen, uh, from one person with like a staccato delivery to another, I totally understand. Everybody's like, why do you speak so quickly? (laughs) I'm like, why don't you listen fast enough? It's hard. I've got a lot (laughs) I got to say. You know what I mean? (laughs) I never know when you're going to tune out. So we got to get as much in as possible as fast as we can. (laughs) Just bolus information. (laughs) Yes. Yes. So obviously I, I said, you know, professionally what you do. This show is also about who you are. And while those things definitely come together for all of us, who we are and what we do, they're not really one and the same. And I kind of wanted to just start off a little bit with something that really intrigued me from an episode that I heard you on previously, which was that you actually had a career as a sportscaster early on. (laughs) That's correct. (laughs) I had no clue about that. And I was like, this is where I'm starting. I want to know because you've transitioned to something drastically different. So (laughs) (laughs) um, have you always had a passion for the sciences um, and, and, just decided to follow that later on or what ultimately led you to where you are or away from sports casting? Sure. So yeah, I've always had an aptitude for the sciences uh, and I would say it's more than just an aptitude. It's sort of this very passionate focus on the sciences. Uh, I tell the story quite frequently that, you know, when you got to the age where you're starting to date, you know, in like middle school and you got a little boyfriend or girlfriend uh, and that was going on. I was actually raising brine shrimp to study their uh, morphologic changes as they developed. Right. So that was my jam. Like was that I, for a project or just because you wanted to? No, that's just uh, that was just the old uh, curiosity meter going off. Uh, and, you know, I could name like the taxology or uh, taxonomy of all the dinosaurs and things like that. And so uh, I've always just loved it. I've loved our world and the development of it and the universe, et cetera. Uh, and then it was weird because I got into college and I did what I think many people in college do is where you sort of look around. You're like, well, what do I do with my life? Right. And yeah. I was an athlete at the time and I'm a ham in front of the camera. And so sports casting was sort of this thing that presented itself to me and I was good at it. And so, you know, making money on the weekends as a broke college student, I I began doing sports journalism and casting. And I was actually sports casting for the arena football team in San Diego. Okay. And I was field side. And then I was doing like, uh, you know, college games and things like that. And it was really awesome. And I was great at it. And then, uh, my dad got sick, right. Then life happens. And we, he had this very aggressive cancer that developed and he was having all of these radical surgeries and the family was taking a hit, you know, and, uh, his, his life was really sort of on the line, you know, it was a very tenuous thing and nobody really knew prognostically what was going to happen. And so one day I'm field side and they're counting down. I got the production manager in my ear. He's like in a van across the field and they're counting me down. And I've got these lights in my face and I've got, you know, the, the telecom guys are like three, two, one. And I'm standing there holding this mic field side. And I remember plain as day thinking, what the hell am I doing with my life right now? You know, I could be 
utilizing my gifts and my talents for something so much more impactful just for, you know, the human condition after what myself and my father and my family had been going through. And so the very next week I quit and I had had like a very strong upward trajectory in that field. And it's really funny. I actually haven't talked about this on a podcast yet, but my dad, you know, like you, you tell your parents something like I'm going to go to medical school or I'm going to pursue. And you think that they're going to be like, Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Yeah. I told my dad, I quit sports casting for medicine because of him. And he was like, are you out of your fucking mind? And he was, he was so mad. And, uh, and so, yeah, so that that's sort of what happened is I, I said, you know what, I want to self-actualize. There's something bigger for me and more philosophically impactful that I can do to help other people. And, uh, I, I began the journey of self-discovery. And I, again, I'd always had this passion for the sciences and that's sort of where I, I was led. I guess if the witching sticks to find water, it was like my witching sticks to eventually find science again. So yeah, uh, I, I switched, um, uh, like kind of mid college and, uh, had to do a bunch of auxiliary sciences and have a bunch of degrees and student loans now and never looked back. <laughs> well, I, I will say as as much of a burden as the student loans can be, because I'm uh, I'm no stranger to those. I will say that I feel like the fact that you made that transition is amazing for a number of reasons. One, I think that what you said about self-actualization is so important for people to think about. I have always said, I feel like I meant for something more. I, I fell ass backwards into technology because I graduated at the peak of the recession. And I was just like, I need a job because I need healthcare. And I, you know, all these decisions are made because of the circumstances and not because what actually feels right to you. So I admire that you were in a position that was showing you growth opportunities and you were like, but it doesn't feel right to me because if it doesn't feel right, eventually that light burns out and you're just left holding what, you know, I, I feel like that's really admirable that you took the opportunity and, and seized it as a way to sort of transition into something that felt more meaningful to you. And I think that that is so important to do cross checks through the course of your life, right? Because For sure. we evolve as humans and especially when you're younger, you know, your personality is evolving, you know, what you want out of life you're beginning to discover. And so it's okay to make pivots then. But I also am a champion for if you're 50, 60 years old, you're like, I don't like what I'm doing, or I want to just start a pottery class and, and quit business or, you know, whatever, do yeah. it, you know, because life is so short and so fragile. And that is a gift that I've been given being in medical sciences, you know, because I worked in oncology, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so you get to see, you know, the, and, and you, you're given back, you know, patients would thank us as researchers. And I'm like, no, you don't understand like the gift that you have given me. It is grounded me and you've given me contextualization for the important things in life. Right. And so few people, I think, get that opportunity to really get rattled or, you know, see the, the human condition at its most frail. And, uh, and they don't, they don't get the, the light bulb moment where they're like, ah, the money doesn't matter. This doesn't matter. The status doesn't matter. What matters is, you know, my existence and my sentience and, and how I choose to live in, in that capacity. So. That's so beautiful. I love that you just said that. And I agree. I mean, so when my mom passed away a couple of years ago, it was super, super sudden. And it was like nothing else in the world really seemed like it mattered. And I remember going back to work and having my boss tell me that I was under scrutiny for non-performance after that and other situations that were happening. And I was like, I don't care. Like, I don't. So it was sort of my moment that you described on the side of the field. You're we like, this is not, this is not where I'm supposed to be. It's not relevant. And mm -hmm. the fact that you went into the medical field after just um, going through this experience with your family is also a testament to just in general, the type of person that you must be, right? Because it it's part of it is you have this interest and you have this desire to understand and to know, but it also seems like your dad being sick was a catalyst for like really inspiring. What do I want the impact of my work to be? Sure. And, you know, I think it's a good field if anybody out there is kicking around, you know, I don't really know what I want to do. I like science or, you know, I'm not really sure where to take it. I feel like if you've got a big heart, being in medicine is a good place for you to apply that scientific aptitude, you know, because that that's sort of one of the big things for me is being in upstream medical research. You have the capacity with a patent or an invention or something that you discover or, you know, research you produce to impact possibly thousands and thousands of lives. And so if that's something that's important to you, that's something you need to consider in your vocation, right? Because mm -hmm. it's one of those things where, you know, I don't, 
I don't live to work. You know what I mean? I work to live. And so if you can marry your passions and helping other people into like one little neat basket, what a beautiful thing, you know, what a, what an absolutely beautiful thing. Yeah, totally. So you have obviously your science background, your 14 year career across the science fields that I mentioned, but I would say you've gained quite the following on social media for the work that you're doing there. And something that you said that I loved um, in another interview was that people don't want to sit and listen to a 45 minute lecture. They want something that's essentially bite sized palatable. I'm paraphrasing that part, Um, but that we want something that's quick and effective to give us some sense of clarity without being patronized also. And you strike that balance beautifully. I mean, I I feel like it speaks in, in the following that you have, but also the way that you do it, it's palatable to the most unknowledgeable person where it's like, I wish more people could communicate like that. Do you feel that because you said, you know, you have the gift of gab, you have the presence of mind, you have the science background. Do you feel like this is something that more people in your field should be seeking to do so that there is more positive reinforcement of the well, first of all, correct information, validated information, but, but, but also to help make people more curious and interested and diversify their knowledge. Of course, you know, and I think the biggest issue right now that science has is it's got a PR problem, right? And I think, and I always charge my colleagues, I, I think that the, the worst thing that we can do with a public that is fearful and dubious now because of everything in the fallout that sort of transpired post COVID. Um, the worst thing we can do is turn our back. Right. Mm -hmm. Because I always say if the public doesn't know the, the basic sciences and they don't understand what it is we're doing, that's our fault. That's not their fault. Right. Because the average, you know, the average uh, United States citizen has a sixth grade reading level. Right. And we are so siloed in what we do. You know, I, I specialize in, peripheral nerve repair and regeneration, you know, that it's such a subspecific thing to focus on. How, how would I expect somebody, you know, that is, you know, working three jobs and doing what they can to support a family and never got the opportunity through, you know, whatever socioeconomic class they started in to be able to study this. I mean, I truly do think that it's become a thing of privilege and it shouldn't be right. So mm-hmm. at the end of the day, what I say is, it is our job to sort of inform the public and it's our job to help to bolster that, that literacy level, because science is really the palette with which we paint the understanding of our universe and our place within it. And so if, if we, if we, we shouldn't be sort of allowing only people that have the ability to go to college, et cetera, to be able to understand these things. Right. And, and it is a gift to be able to sort of communicate that to people. And the, the, you know, I, I work full time as a scientist and then I'm also doing science when I get home, you know what I mean? And so I, I'm constantly on the go with this and people are like, Oh, I don't know how you do it. And I'm like, because when I get messages from people saying, you know, I'll be honest, I failed out of every science course in high school, but I found you. And now I literally seek out scientific news and things or, and they send me articles. I mean, that is the biggest blessing and the most hum like humbling thing I could ever receive f- feedback I could receive. So well, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I love that you shared that. And you're right. I feel like it's hard. I think, you know, I grew up in what I would say is middle, upper middle class suburban America. We didn't really want for much. Um, You know, there were varying economic times in our family, but I was well educated. I knew, you know, I was going to be able to go to college. And I think, you know, it's funny because growing up, And I was just talking to somebody in an earlier episode about how I didn't really care to learn history when I was reading a textbook. And I didn't really care to learn science from reading a textbook. I always liked the more practical application of it. It made more sense to me. It's also like the only reason that I passed physics because I am not good at the math side of it. I'm like, I can understand conceptually how it works, but I can't do the equation to get there. Okay. <laughs> that's just that's not totally happening. <laughs> um, and, and I'm fascinated by it and I want to know more, but when you feel like you're sort of pigeonholed into this is how you have to learn it, or this is the only way you can know this information, we're maybe being limited by our circumstance, but we also limit ourselves. I think a lot of people feel stupid asking questions, hence your book, right? And I and I love that you 
you titled it the way that you did, that there are no stupid questions, dot, dot, dot in science. But in general, I think it invites people to be more curious and open about that curiosity. And because you deliver the the questions and the answers in a way that is not only simple to understand, but also I think really connective on a human level. It's like, you're not coming at it from such a clinical perspective that somebody can't relate to what you're saying. Like there are ways to apply what you're saying and what you're teaching to something that might be happening in your life or a question that you've had before. Is that something that going into this, um, maybe the field entirely, but also specifically as a science communicator that was really important to you to be able to find that balance? Absolutely. And my, my biggest, I think, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, like swell in engagement with the public was when I let go of the reins and I allowed them to dictate the material that they wanted to learn. Right. Because I think it is a fallacy to try to engage people in a way that gets them excited by being a lecturer top down, you know, like I'm going to tell you what you need to learn because Mm -hmm. that harps on exactly what you've been saying, you know, learning and sort of bridging these neural connections in our mind and committing things to memory. This is all individualized per person, right? There are visual learners, there's auditory learners, there are people that learn via reading. And so one size fits all doesn't work. We know this. And I think that the death of our education system is coming about as we sort of continue to pump more and more standardized exams into the matrix. Oh, yeah. And so what it does is it it disallows for curiosity. But what I wanted to do is I wanted the readers to really connect with the idea that they are scientists, right? Because scientists are just like everybody else. It's just that we never outgrew the why phase when we were kids and then we turned it into a profession. And so I wanted the audience to feel like they were the ones driving the science. They were the ones that were dictating the scientific discovery. So every question in the book is a question answered by somebody from around the world. These are nothing that I came up with. This is from everybody else. And I feel like that is really the only way to do that. And um, I, I'm pleased that it has taken off in the way that it has. Yeah, it's interesting too that you said about the standardized tests and how that's really sort of the death of the education system. I agree. Uh, um, my mother would have agreed 100%. It's like, because if you're just teaching to the test, you're not inviting the questions or the additional expansion of knowledge beyond that. And I will say frequently, whenever I discuss sort of my educational career, especially leading up to college, where it's less practical application and more of that type of test is I was a stuff and flush, like get in as much in as you can. And then when you don't need any more, get it out. Now I probably remember bits and pieces of things that I learned along the way, but it was hot. My success was highly predicated on my ability to somewhat memorize the words on the page or the images or the, the function of whatever it was that I needed. It wasn't truly absorbing the information, comprehending it and storing that away for use at a later date. It was primarily, I need this outcome. So I'm going to get this information in the way that that output needs to show up on the page. And it's just not conducive to long-term growth. Not at all. You know, it's just, it, it forces you to regurgitate. And in an era of science and technology where our economies will be predicated on pumping more and more scientists and engineers, et cetera, into the field, you know, the, these are fields where in critical thinking, is paramount to the success of what it is you're trying to do or develop, et cetera. And so when you begin to kind of squash that, you know, what, what kinds of scientists and engineers are we going to have in the next generation? Like you can't, (laughs) I don't even want to know. (laughs) You can't do the regurgitation thing professionally if you want to develop and innovate. And, uh, you know, so yeah, I, I agree with you and I would have agreed with your mother and we could have all sat down and been like, this is crazy. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. (laughs) I appreciate that. It makes me wonder, do you feel like and and this is maybe more of just a subjective question because I, or potentially you have information that would help inform this, but because of all of the chaos that is ensuing on the internet with misinformation, with the um, just sort of false dialogues that are happening, do you feel like there's a change in the volume of people that are pursuing uh scientific careers for better or for worse? Because I mean, in the medical field specifically, especially practitioners. Like, I mean, I've watched friends leave because it's just, it, it's just not conducive to a life well lived for a lot of people. But I'm wondering if from your side of it and, and the, the area in which you specialize, you're seeing that as well. You know, 
it seems as if there there are more people going into the field every year, but I think that if you look at the growth rate proportionally, it's not staggering the way that it needs to be. Mm -hmm. I think that the number of people going to the field is increasing because the population is increasing. So it's sort of just by virtue of a higher number of people, you have a higher number quantitatively. But, you know, like I said, in an era of science and technology, we need a massive influx of, of people and, and more to the point, diverse people, mm -hmm. because when you you're in a think tank scenario and you're trying to solve a problem, it's integral to have so many different kinds of perspectives on things. And, you know, you're seeing a, a bit more diversity, which is great, but I don't think that we are getting the mad rush to sort of populate the scientific fields that you would hope for the era that we are in, especially mm -hmm. with the big problems we need to solve, right? Like how do you cure cancer? How do you stymie global warming? Like these are things where you need kind of all hands on deck. And I feel like you're just not seeing that. And I know for a fact in medicine specifically, there has been a well-documented, they call it brain drain brain where bright students are now going into things like business because it pays better. And, you know, like physicians just aren't being compensated. And so many students, very bright students simply cannot afford to pay that tuition to go to medical school. So they go into something else. Oh. And uh, that's also <laughs> wild to me. <laughs> you know? It's heartbreaking, honestly. Heartbreaking. But and what you're speaking to, Leah, too, in, in terms of the diversity, it's like we desperately need the diversity. We need the diversity of thought. We need the diversity of the just overall types of people who can create the diversity of thought. And something that I had listened to or watched the other day, I'm curious if you have thoughts or, or knowledge on this um, around part of the reason that we also see issues with certain Oh my God, this would be hilarious if this was something you mentioned. And then I'm like <laughs> parroting it back to you because I'm like, did you say this? Um, but about how like we're not creating necessarily um, solutions, whether that's um, medical treatment in terms of medicine or, or other um, modalities that necessarily are appropriate for like, let's say male versus female, because like the idea is that well, this worked for men. And so they keep building it as if this is like everybody who's ever needing this medication, for example, is a male, but it's not having the same effect for women, but they're also not researching ways to enhance it or or create variables to help people in other ways. Uh, was that even a question? I'm sorry. That was probably like the most... No, no I, collection of thoughts. Did you get anything out of it that you can use? <laughs> Listen, I'm picking up what you're throwing down here. All right, thanks. <laughs> I'm like, um, that was the most I bumbled this entire series. So you, yeah, <laughs> like, I don't know what just happened, but my brain's operating on overload because I know you've got answers. I, I've got you. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, some of the brave new world type medicine is, you know, gender disparities. Yes. Mm -hmm. But then also wrapping our heads around when you have trans patients, you know, so you have, let's say like a trans male and something that we're running into is a problem where, because that patient now identifies as male, we are forgetting to screen for things like breast cancer at certain stage. And you're like, Oh geez, like, you know, because we started with this endocrine cascade. And so they are still a risk factor for breast cancer, but because they're now trans male physicians are forgetting to say like, Hey, you know, there's some biology here that we need to make sure that we're screening for mm -hmm. just by virtue of, you know, what you were at birth. And so that's getting very sticky as well. Um, but yeah, efficacy for things, um, you see a lot of terrible efficacy rates in oncology with like black women, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Women of color, they come in and even when you adjust for things like the stage that they are diagnosed, et cetera, for some reason they have worse outcomes mm -hmm. and we don't, and th these things are not necessarily being well explored. So yeah, you're absolutely right. It's not even just let's have diversity of thought, but we need representatives from these marginalized groups to speak up and to say like, Hey, <laughs> you know, there's a bunch of like older white dudes that have been running the show for a while. And so it seems like those have been the triaged groups. And now we need to really kind of understand a bit more about biology, the endocrine system, you know, the way that DNA translates, et cetera, to see, can we maximize outcomes for these other groups that are not necessarily doing as well as they should, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for, thank you for getting there when I, when I couldn't. <laughs> Halfway through, I was like, I really hope this is what she asked me. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, it was, it's, at this point, listeners won't even know. Um, just as long as you're here for the ride, guys. Um, so another thing that um, you had said 
in um I, I basically I like to prep for episodes by like finding other content that gives me some inspiration usually if um if there's not something else that sort of draws my attention. I love and, it. I really hope you're like something that you said that was really offensive. I'm like, oh man. <laughs> <laughs> No, actually, you said so many insightful (laughs) things. And I was like, great, this is going to be something I'm going to have to like rein it in. But, you know, you said it's typically pretty unusual to bounce between specialties, but you're inherently, as you've said, a very curious person. And and you kind of want to know about everything. I relate to that a lot. Um, Our Google searches, especially like once you veer into the bedtime, are just, you're like, why though? Do you know what I know about silkworms? Probably not. And nor will you ever need to. But (laughs) um. So when it comes to, you know, what you're doing and what you specialize in, but also your areas of focus, how have you come to a place where you, you've decided like, this is really where you want to spend your energy, your time? You know, that's a really good question. I, I think that when you, when you have an, it's weird because as an adult, I I used to think like, oh man, that's so crazy. Like my friends have ADD and things like that. And then I do things as an adult. I'm like, do I have diagnosable ADD? <laughs> right. And, and I've, I've been thinking about this a lot, like over the last year, I'm like, I might just have like untreated ADD because I'm kind of the, like, somebody will ask me a question and I'll be like, look at the butterfly, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> literally mid sentence. And, um, you know, a lot of that has kind of translated into the way that I consume information and more to the point, the way that I apply the knowledge that I have gained mm. over the course of my life. And so my educational background is quite diverse. You know, I I have a master's in biotech. I learned cancer biology and all of these things, et cetera. And then I have another one in epidemiology and biostats. So for me, my baseline level, you know, I've got all of these like heavy sciences, graduate sciences that I've studied both lab and clinical. And then I also have biostatistics that I can apply. So you can kind of take me as a little utility player and like plunk me into any medical subspecialty. And it's just going to take me a couple of weeks to refresh what I learned to get up to speed. And then I'm kind of off to the races. And this is, um, this is super highly unusual, but what I see is that this is a reflection of sort of just generationally, I think we're really getting away from the, okay, I'm going to pick one job and I'm going to work at one facility for 35 years and then I'm going to retire. Right. Yeah. And you see millennials doing this where they're like, you know what? I'm not happy here. I'm out. You know? I mean, now- I changed jobs like every two years for a really long time until I ultimately just left tech. And I was like, I'm just not going to do that anymore at all. I'm changing. Yeah. It. We're chasing quality of life, right. Over careers. And I think that that that's extraordinary. And for me in picking, you know, it was sort of a, I, you know, I would pivot out and I would see a job description and I'd be like, Ooh, I like that. You know, like, Ooh, like the cancer center needs somebody to like run all of the internal studies and to like help do ad hoc biostatistics. And like, I can do that. I can crush that. And I already have like a background in cancer biology as a graduate student. So let's run it. And then, you know, um, sort of when I pivoted into nerve repair, it was the same thing. You know, I saw a job description and I was like, that is so cool. And, you know, I get to be a think tank member and I can travel and I can teach microsurgery and I would love to do that. Let me throw my hat in the ring. And then I was really thirsty for the job. So I gave them multiple cover letters and just kept harassing the HR department. They were like, okay, we'll interview. (laughs) And so it's sort of me chasing, sort of building skill sets. And then if something happens, say I move out of state, which I had done frequently for just uh, my academic career or, you know, what have you life happens. And then I, I land somewhere. I don't necessarily feel pressured to say, I, okay, I started in orthopedics. I have to stay in orthopedics. I'm like, who's looking for a scientist? I got you. (laughs) And then I just, I throw my hat in the ring and I've, I really like it. And a lot of other scientists are like, you have the craziest publication background. (laughs) Like you have so many random publications. Yeah. And I kind of, I kind of dig it. And I feel like Google Leah Elson, you'll find it. It's, I mean, it is robust. (laughs) It is robust and highly varied. And everyone's like, I don't understand what this is. Like what a weird pizza she's made with all of these things (laughs) on these weird toppings. Um, But I, I feel like I'm sort of on the bleeding edge of the next generation of scientists where we're like, Hey, science is science, right? The scientific method and everything, like it doesn't change between subspecialty. And if you're bright and quick and you like to learn, you'll get up to speed on whatever it is that you need to do when you're there. And, uh, and then it's off to the races. So yeah, that was my very long winded answer. (laughs) No, I love it. I always joke around slash say, seriously, I'm nothing if not verbose. So absolutely. (laughs) Uh, that didn't work well in work meetings, but it's great for a podcast. <laughs> Relatable. 
<laughs> well, it, it also, to your point about being on the bleeding edge, I think that that's, it makes me wonder if that will actually help with the longevity of people really having satisfaction in their careers because you're not bored. You have something that's both sustainable, but can be novel at points in time. So it gives you the flexibility to seek, you know, your passion that is also a, a an important element of social security and stability that we have in, in making sure that you can have a paycheck and, and a roof over your head and all those necessities. But I love the idea that you can diversify what you're doing coming from a field. So being in tech as a product manager, um, I worked for a variety of businesses, but I was most consistently in HR tech. And it was like, I could do what I was doing in any variety of fields. It just so happened that I kept being in this one, but it was super important to me when I kind of got to a, a real breaking point in wanting to get out of tech in general, that I was like, at the very least, I need to switch gears here. At the sure. very least, I need to like move into a different topic and or, or just sort of specialty. And so I understand and can appreciate that desire to have not only more opportunities, but just uh, in terms of the the job market, but more opportunities to kind of dive into like, what is it that you like or don't like? Because you it's kind of like when my mom would try to feed me something when I was a kid. And it's like, if you don't like it, you don't have to eat it, but you at least have to try it. Right. So it's like, why not? I love that. And, you know, for you, I think that's, that's a brave thing to do. You know what I mean? To be like, I'm just going to completely switch gears because so many people are mired down by the idea that if I switch, I'm not going to be successful. I'm going to then become destitute and homeless. And really the, the job market is quite flush with different things to do. And yeah. so, yeah, I absolutely agree. Like, why not give it a try? Even if you hate it, at least, you know, you hate it and you never have to wonder. I always say, I never want to wonder what if, so you kind of dive in head first. And right before we recorded this episode, we were talking about how I'm recklessly spontaneous and how that has obviously never gotten me into trouble, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's been, it's been wildly fun and, uh, you know, it's, it's fun. Diversify like stocks, right? Diversify your portfolio. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. I love it. Yes. Yes. You heard it here first folks. Um, exactly. well, don't take financial advice from me though, please <laughs> looking at my student debt right now. Please do not. <laughs> You're like, I'm very, very acclaimed in my field, but I am not by any means your accountant. Absolutely not. <laughs> Just a disclaimer. Um, well, it, it that line of thinking too, Leah, made me uh, want to acknowledge something that you said that was, if you're authentic to yourself, your audience will find you. And I highlighted that and bolded it on my notes because it is something that, I am very much trying to remind myself of at present moment. And also because I think it speaks to the fact that we are not, you know, for everybody, the thing sure. that we do, the thing that we love, whatever it is that we're creating in the world, you know, it first and foremost has to be for us. It ha and it's not to come from a place of selfishness, but to come from a place of authenticity and to really understand yourself enough to know that, if you do that, you can inherently create value. Do you feel like that's something that has been challenging for you as you've been navigating your nine to five job and also a, a, a ever growing, you know, social media presence, um, authorship, et cetera? You know, it is, a, it's, it can be exhausting surely, but I think the difference is, and this is sort of where the crux of if you're authentic to what you want to do, your audience will find you, but also you will not get fatigued by it, right? Because this is something that I, I love to do so much and I love interfacing with the public and I love inspiring this curiosity that, you know, even it, it's like the, the viewers keep me going, you know, even if I, I mean, today, for instance, I took a red eye flight to fly in this morning. I drove two hours to get home. I just worked a full work day. I'm doing this interview. And then right after this, I'm doing a real science episode. <laughs> and thank you. Thanks for, uh, thanks, for, listen, thanks for getting this into your day. Listen, I, I had you hard, like etched in, like in a <laughs> knife in my calendar. I was like, we're doing this episode. Um, but, but I love it, you know, and it's like, 
if it's sort of, it's cliche, yes, but I think it speaks to the, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. And so even if, you know, the Instagram algorithm for a while was just absolute trash and, you know, it was like, I, I'm getting 500 views. This is crazy. But I kept going, you know, because I like doing it. And then it yeah. eventually picked up again. And now we've reached this like raucous <laughs> amount of followers that just keep flooding in. I'm like, I'm not qualified to lead you people, but, <laughs> um, so it's, uh, you know, I, I, for content creators out there, it can be slow going and it can be discouraging to, you know, be like, ah, man, I'm never going to get to that level. But I mean, I've been doing this for six years and I yeah. never would have thought like, oh, I'd be staring down the barrel of like 65,000 followers, however, what between platforms. Um, so just keep going, you know, and, yeah. and your audience will find you. They will. You just got to capitalize on the hashtags, <laughs> yeah, <just keep> going. <laughs> uh, but if you love it, you know, keep it's people need you. People need to hear and especially for podcast hosts, people need your voice, right? We we're talking about diversity. People need to hear from you specifically, yeah. Nikki. <laughs> so keep going. Like, don't give this up. You're, I mean, you're a tremendous host. So yeah. thank you. Thank you so much. Um, well, you know, the fact that you said that with such enthusiasm really helps me segue into something else. I wanted to ask you, you had, um, made a comment and something else I listened to you about, you know, what really excites you, you know, what is it that kind of brings you that light? And it made me think about the fact that people really learn better also when they're engaged. So do you feel like you try to bring not only sort of the accessibility of the information that you're sharing, but the excitement that you have for it to the content that you're creating and whether that is on social media or even just in your day-to-day -day job? Because I mean, that's the part of you that we're not seeing, right? We're seeing you in front of the camera, teaching us things that we want to know that we never knew we needed to know or wanted to know. But, you know, you also have this other part of your life that is not in front of the screen where you're making really valuable contributions to the world. And I mean, I have to imagine that that provides its own level of excitement for you. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I, I get very excited by seeing other people get excited. And one of the things that I suppose you could say I do in my capacity as a professional scientist is that I help to build advocacy around nerve repair patients that are not getting great outcomes, marginalized patient groups. And I speak to surgeons. So I go mm. and I lecture and I talk about nerve science. I talk about things to keep in mind when, you know, actually doing a nerve repair and, you know, tips and tricks. And I teach sort of nine to five. And I also teach afterwards and it's getting people engaged and like enthralled in what you're talking about. That is exciting. Right. Um, and so, you know, the enthusiasm, I, th I think a lot of people, when they meet me, you know, in book signings or they interview me one-on-one, -on -one, the common thread that I hear, which is now I'm like, okay, I get it. They're always like, oh, you're this enthusiastic all the time. And I'm like, yeah, no, I am. I am like this at my job. I am like this, you know, sort of in my secondary job, I guess you could say. And um, it's really, I mean, it sounds corny, but I mean, I'll just say it. It's really just because science truly does like light up my life. You know what I mean? I, I think it's awesome. And I love imparting that passion to other people. Yeah. Well, and I love that you bring that passion because I think that that is what makes you extremely engaging in your secondary job. You know, <laughs> it, it, people can sit there and you can listen to somebody talking and they can blather on saying the exact same things that you're saying, but you feel like they're blathering because it's not interesting, engaging or exciting the way that they're delivering it. And delivery does matter because you want to feel like what you're hearing or you're consuming is relevant or important to you. And if somebody's just sort of blankly saying that, I think about teachers I had growing up where it was like, there's a big difference between the teacher that is like in there talking to you like they're, they're, they want you to really love what you're hearing versus the ones that are just reading from the textbook and telling you to take your notes and pointing to the chalkboard, right? Or chalkboard, geez, I just dated myself. <laughs> <laughs> Fix it and post the, the, Fix the it stone post. tablets that they <laughs> hung on the wall. When we were using an abacus in class. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> you know how I know that you're my people, Leah, because my wife and I were just talking about the abacus the other day. I don't know the last time I even said the word abacus. Perfect. I'll be so honest. <laughs> so good. I'm so glad you did. It's really, I feel seen. <laughs> oh my gosh. Shout out to your wife. I hope she listens to this and she's like, geez. <laughs> oh man. Well, I will tell you that she is by far, I have a lot of very great fans, friends and listeners, but my wife is, um, 
I had no idea how excited she was about my podcast because she started listening to it when we were friends. Like that's how we sort of became friends. We met online. She binge listened to my first couple of seasons and was like, I need to know you. And um, then when I set up my, so our love story unfolded, we live together now, we're married, et cetera. Um, we're skipping a lot of really important in-between details. But <laughs> um, I when I set up my studio in our house when we moved in together, um, I was like, hey, do you want to check it out? Have you ever, you know, used this before? And so I put my, uh, I put the headphones on her and I lean in and I go, hi, I'm Nikki LaCroce. And she's like, ah! and I was like, oh my God, seriously? I was like, this is why you fell in love with me. <laughs> you know what though? I'm going to go ahead and say this. Like, that's the sickest game I've ever heard. You know what I mean? Like your game is strong to be like, yeah, baby, put on the headphones. <laughs> Let me croon to you in my sultry recording voice. I also had no idea. I was like, wait, this is amazing. I had no clue this is what happened. This makes total sense now, though, and I am very grateful. I, I said to her, I was like, if for no other reason that I created this podcast, if it if it made all of this unfold, I'm here for it. So I love it. <laughs> Sometimes we got to play the long game for the ones we, you know what I mean? Yeah, I love absolutely. It. I love it. <laughs> Um, so, you know, we've got a little bit of time left here and I, I, you know, I have plenty of questions that I could ask you, but from your perspective, when you're doing a lot of press, you've got a lot of shows, you've got your own content that you're creating. Is there anything that you have been dying to talk about or want to share about you that doesn't make it to the mic? Um, loaded sure. question. Yeah, no, definitely loaded, but definitely one I'm willing to talk about. Um, I think that one of the biggest misconceptions about me, which is not something that I brand as a misconception, but people might fall into it mm -hmm. because I have a, you know, I've been very fortunate enough to go to very large institutions, right? I went to Harvard, I went to Hopkins, I went to USC. Um, and so I think there's this perception that like, oh, you know, Leah was like a legacy student or, you know, she came from a good family. And uh, actually, like, I'm the only scientist in my family, and I grew up very socioeconomically disadvantaged. And so everything that I have done, I mean, like, going to Harvard was the most mind blowing thing in my life, because I went there under like my own uh, fortitude under everything that I possibly could to get there. And more to the point, like, my childhood was very troubled. I had a very, very sort of I, I mean, putting it lightly, I, I had a, a tumultuous childhood and, you know, I was with a, a parent that was not really a great parent and my parents were split. And so, you know, I, I would love for that to be known just as a testament to other people that are like, I could never do that because I don't have the resources, but I'm telling you like point blank period, I had not only no resources, but I had like all the reasons to become sort of a statistic and like maybe not do great things with my life or maybe fall into things like addiction or something like that, you know, based upon sort of the environment that I was in. And so I want that story to be known is that if you're out there and you're like, man, like one day, maybe, maybe, you know, I could, but I don't know because I, I don't have, you do, you absolutely do, you know, and sometimes you have to be your own biggest champion. And I have been my entire life, you mm. know, um, and sometimes you, it's going to suck, you know, it's going to, I mean, when I was at Harvard, my lights got shut off on multiple occasions and I was studying by candlelight and I was doing everything I could to get by. I mean, I've, I haven't been just a student since I was in high school, right? I've worked full time while taking all these heavy courses while doing graduate work because I had to, to make it through. Um, and so if you're listening to this and you're like, there's something I want to do, but I don't think I can, you can. The only difference between a dream and a reality is just putting steps in place to get there, you know, just make tangible steps one after the other one foot in front of the other. And it's going to take a long time. It took me a really long time, but I did it. Damn it. I did it. So yeah, you did. <laughs> you can too. I'm telling you, you absolutely can. So that's the sort of like other side of the bubbly, the bubbly yeah. scientist on screen is that there, there's a very dark past. Um, and, but you know what? to hell with it. I did it anyway. <laughs> so. Well, I love that you shared that. And I, you know, I, I kind of want to tug at that thread if you're open to it, but I sure. don't want, I, this is, as I said, this is your, your episode to, to share what you'd like to share. And, um, now I'm like, why didn't I ask this question? Sooner? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know what though? Like, this is the first time 
that I can think of that I've actually talked about it openly. So, you know, you wouldn't be the first person to not see like peek under the hood as it were. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I I mean, I, I love that you shared that because I, I mean, first of all, I appreciate the vulnerability and I appreciate the desire to help other people see the opportunity in that. That's the point of this show. I, I've gotten to a place where I recognize that, you know, not every guest is going to be a fit, but everybody does have a story. And I encourage people to lean into that. It's hard to go there and it's uncomfortable sometimes to go there. In fact, there's plenty of reasons not to do it, right? Similar to what you were just saying. But when you do go there, sometimes it's that one person who hears it. It could be that they're going to hear the real that comes from that, or they're going to listen to the full episode and they're going to have this moment of clarity or feeling seen or understood. And that just changes everything for me. So when you were talking about, you know, when people come in with, you know, comments or appreciation for everything that you're doing, like guests opening up and going to that place on this show, that's what that is for me. That's like, I'm so grateful that somebody trusted me and is wanting to share that because that's, that's the entire point. Like that's, it's who the fuck am I? Who are you? You know? Of um, course. So growing up, was it something that where you thought you might not end up going to college or, or furthering your education? Yeah, I didn't have, I think looking back, you know, students kind of their parents were like, okay, you know, it's your junior year. Let's start looking at colleges yeah. or, you know, let's start studying for the SATs. And I just didn't, I didn't have guidance, you know. Um, like my childhood was very sort of like parental figure free. I would say again, like putting this very like PG. Um, it and doesn't have to be, you're welcome to keep it there, but just so you know, like if, if you feel like you want to delve into anything, you're more than welcome to. Sure. Sure. Um, yeah, it was just, it was sort of a, it was like a toxic environment. So it wasn't even like, Oh, well, my, 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 you know, my, my parent that I was living with full time, it wasn't just that like, they didn't, they didn't do, it was just, it was like, worse than that. It was sort of like a beat down and sort of like a psychological kind of like beat down pretty frequently. And so I sort of, um, you know, I, I didn't really, like, I didn't study for the SATs. I did well, thankfully. And Mm. like, I didn't really visit colleges. Like I, I didn't have any guidance in that capacity. And so I sort of like bumbled my way through it initially, you know what I mean? And I'm like, I guess I'm just going to go here, you know? And then, yeah, yeah. So I began to sort of learn on my own. And uh, I think that, you know, did it put me at a disadvantage? Maybe initially, but that's sort of where my story, I hope, opens up the floor for people is because everything that I've done, like every school I've gone to, everything that it took to get there, I had to find out on my own, right? I didn't have a parent being like, let's go, you got this. Or like, this is the this is the route you're supposed to take because they didn't have that background either, right? right? I'm sort of like the first. Um, and so, you know, it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was difficult and weird. And I didn't know it at the time. I was like, oh, everybody does this. And then I was like, oh man, you guys had support yet. You, you had like, <laughs> like your parents got you stuff to study for the SATs. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I, I consider myself very lucky and really what happened for me, I think my escapism was academic. So mm. I, when I was in high school, it was like, varsity athletes, student government in clubs, like taking AP courses because I was trying to get out of the house. Right. And then that just ended up like building me up to go and do better things. Um, but that's a testament to also the, the grit, right? I mean, I, a big part of this process for me, for my own self, but also something that really helped me understand what ties every guest together. it, It is that resilience of the human spirit. Sure. It is that desire to do something that, you know, I don't even want to say it, it, it's not really even about recovery um, because it's, it, there may not be something to recover from, but it's recognizing that your circumstance doesn't have to dictate your future. And uh, I will say everybody goes through shit. There are varying degrees of shit that we all go through. And um, I was listening to something the other day where it's like, but this isn't the trauma Olympics. It's an, yeah. like, it's it's not about comparing yours to somebody else's. It's how can you take the circumstance that you've been dealt and turn that into something that can help you or propel you instead of, of holding you back. And that's not to say we don't process or have to go through hard times with those things. But at the end of the day, you have to make a choice and you made choices for yourself to help accelerate 
your academic career and then propel you into where you are now. And I think the interesting thing about going through some kind of trauma, you know, is that, and, you know, this is also me just like speaking vulnerably to the listeners because another misconception is everybody's like, she's so bubbly and she's so happy. I'm like, oh my gosh, look at her. She's look at her go, you know? And I think that even though it's not intentional, there is something that I've been working on a lot in the last year. And that's self-love because I, I talk about it very openly. You see all the degrees on my wall and like a, a book that I wrote and like all these things that I'm doing. And everyone's like, that's so amazing. And I'm like, no, it's pathologic. Like I have a <laughs> pathologic desire to excel as I think a mode of, you know, proving my own self-worth. Validation. Exactly. Because I was told terrible things growing up. And so it's sort of me reconnecting with self-love. But then now that I'm running out of degrees, like, you know what I mean? I'm like, well, no, <laughs> I do. So you're like, well, I need to maybe focus on just loving me for me. And that was the biggest thing that rattled me over the course of this last year is I had a therapist look me in my eyes and she was like, do, if I were to strip away all of your degrees and, you know, whatever, like, would you value yourself? And I literally was like, Oh my God, no, you know, and like, like I, how dare and, you ask me that I know, question and, and force like, me to answer it? First of all, um, I worked very hard for those. <laughs> but, you know, it's one of those moments where I think that that's also important is like somebody who is maybe going through uh, extended tribulations or, you know, the fallout of those tribulations or things are occurring and you're like, you know, you see somebody like me on the internet and you're like, ah, she's so bubbly. She's got it. She's got everything going on. And I'm like, no sister. Like, <laughs> like I got things that I'm working on too. Like we are all human yes. and sometimes our coping mechanisms manifest in very positive ways, but there's still coping mechanisms. Like there's still something that's kind of broken there, which makes me very funny. Like I'm very funny because of all of the trauma, but, uh, it's okay to keep working on it and be a work in progress. You know, like most yeah most internet personalities. And I say that now because I'm like, well, my following is big enough. I can be like, I don't like the word influencer, but I am sort of like a recognizable person in this small little sphere mm -hmm. of mine. And I'm like, no man, like I'm bubbly and happy and I got all this stuff and you know, whatever that's great. But like, it's, it's also a coping mechanism. Yeah. <laughs> so well, I love that you called that out Leah, two things. One, I'm going to come back to not really liking the term influencer because I had a really enlightening conversation with a guest last week about this, that we kind of got a really sour taste in our mouth about the word influencer because of what influencer had really meant when Instagram first came out. There right. is an aesthetic in your mind that you see when you hear the word influencer, no question about it, right? Yeah. Like there is like a type of person and a type of photo that you picture. Or, or you think about the, the page influencers in the wild where they're like, Oh, I don't think I've seen like, that. Now oh. I have to, oh, I will find it though. <laughs> oh, it's, uh, yeah. Go, go to the page influencers in the wild. It's hilarious. <laughs> but, you know, but the thing is, is that the goal is to influence and, and my wife, Nicole and I, we were just talking about this earlier today because it was like, what does it mean to influence? It is a good thing to have the ability to influence people and what you're doing with the work that you're doing in your nine to five career and in your other um, path in science and, and educating is that people are being influenced by your words, Leah, in a positive way. They're, they're hearing what you're saying and they're consuming it and they're learning and that is influence. And I do feel inclined for us as creators to reclaim that because it's not a bad thing to influence people. It's a really good thing. Now, some people can be bad influences and that's the whole <laughs> point, right? Like there is, there is a spectrum of influence, but I, but I would say you, you are influential for sure. And so regardless of the term influence or not, I think that it's really important to, uh, to validate that, that the work that you're doing is impactful. And the other part too, I think is that we find ourselves in these circumstances where, like you said, you know, people are only getting a portion of who you are. And when you're putting something online, that's, that's architected. It can still be authentic, but it's a limited view. And of course. what I, I love about you sharing this part of your story, and thank you so much for doing it, is that these are the conversations that we need to be having too, because it's not what you see in front of you is not everything that somebody is doing or going through. And a prime example is like when I was going through the worst moments of my life, like I'm showing up to work every day and I'm not, nobody knows anything about what's happening in my world. Yep. And so if you don't 
expose that, if you don't invite that, um, you know, vulnerability, whether it's you're, you're expressing it yourself or offering a space for somebody else to share it, then we don't have the ability to relate in that way. And I think there's a lot more relatability in this world than we allow ourselves to see because we're, we're so focused on like, what is that thing that people want to see? Well, Mm -hmm. What they want to see, by the way, is also that vulnerability, but it's like, but is that, but is that like what people, you know, is going to warm their heart and make them feel all excited again? It's like, maybe not, but maybe somebody really needed to see that vulnerability more. Of course, you know, I, and I think that the internet, it's like the best worst thing, right? To happen (laughs) to society. We have unprecedented access to people from different cultures, different geographic areas, you know, different belief systems and dogmas, et cetera. And it should be bringing us together. And oftentimes I feel like it silos us. And a lot of that, I do think that you're right on the money where it is a curated narrative, right? And I try to be as real as possible, but my curated narrative is just that I have a theme that is a science education page. So I'm, you know, it's kind of hard. And I I did at one point earlier on, I had my lifting videos and my dogs and me and then science. And my literary agent was like, okay, I don't even know how to identify your page with all, like, what is this mashup of content that you have? You have to strip this. And I was like, like, it's me. I was like, (laughs) no. And she's like, you have to. And like, you know what? She was right. She was totally right. It was difficult to like, like parse through to get to the science. Um, but it is curated. And I think that we need that harsh reality check every once in a while. And I always use, you know, by way of example, just, you know, like the Instagram couples and you're like, oh my gosh, they're so happy and they're married and they're like baking cookies together. And then you come to find out that they're fighting like cats and dogs behind the scenes in between takes. And it's just, it's a curated narrative, you know, and it's through a lens of whatever thematically you're looking at, but it's not the whole story. It's not. And I I try to be as real as I can, but again, like when I'm really only preaching science, (laughs) it's kind of difficult. Well, but it's different though, right? Because I think being real, um, you certainly are. I I feel like you're a very candid, upfront person. You, You are providing people with facts and we're asking for that. So, so you're, you're giving the people what they want, (laughs) but it's also, I think a matter of, you know, being real is also a function of, you know, how are you showing up in the curated content that you're creating, right? Like you're, because it's curated, doesn't take away from the level of authenticity that you have in doing that. It's just a, a matter of this is what, as you said, thematically people are are looking for and something that you're excited about doing. So you marry those things and it works out great. But if you all of a sudden come on and you're like, okay, well, here's the reality of what's going on in my life right now. We're not talking about science today. I, I'll be honest with you. People, because you have the following now might be like, oh, okay. What's she going to say? Right. But if you're trying to jumpstart something, it's hard because you're trying to find the focal point. And I think once you have the focal point, you can expand out more. But if you start because this is my issue, too, it's like you start broad and then you try to hone it in. It's like people don't know what you're doing to even decide that they want to grab onto it. Exactly. And I I found my sort of medium, if you're looking for a way to do this and you're a content creator and you're like, well, how do I bring in more authenticity? I sort of use my stories as just that blast of things, you know? So I I speak direct to camera. I'm like looking haggard. I'm like, guys, I'm on my third energy drink of the day, but we're getting through it. We're doing a real science. And I want them to see that like weird, gritty, like kind of dark humor behind the scenes underpinning, you know? Um, So it's a, it's a good place to sort of, if you're looking for a way to integrate it, stories, I feel like are the way to go. Okay. So we're, we're kind of rounding out the episode and I, I I really feel so grateful that that you went there, Leah. I'm going to relish this moment. And then when we get off this uh, this conversation, I'm going to be like going down immediately to tell my wife how great it was, because I feel like you you show up exactly the way that you are. Like, I could not ask you to be more real um, (laughs) unless there's something else, obviously, that we're (laughs) going to do. Thank you for uh, like sort of forming an environment of trust. Like it it just kind of came out. So I credit a lot of that to you. Oh, thank you. I, I mean, this is so truly my passion and, and the way that you speak about science is the way that I feel about people. Um, I truly believe that there is so much opportunity to learn from each other and that if we can communicate better about it, what we're feeling, what other people are feeling, the way that we exist in this world, the way that we think, then we have the ability to shift 
some of these or repair, maybe these societal rifts that we're feeling right now. And I feel like that's also part of what you're doing with your work is you're trying to help people understand that, you know, there are ways of thinking about things. And then there are also facts. Sure. <laughs> Sometimes right. those are the same thing. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes not. <laughs> <laughs> um, so as we're kind of um, dialing it down here, uh, is there a particular, you know, future that you envision for the work that you're doing as a science communicator or any outcome that you're hoping to um I don't even want to really say achieve because I feel like that's like you're being like, this is the thing I want to do next and I'm going towards it. But it, it's more of like, is there a specific impact that you're desiring to have and and to grow beyond where you are now or or even just allowing what you're doing right now to proliferate more? You know, I, I think one is to continue to sort of reach the maximum amount of people possible because the beauty about my following as well is that it's this very cult following. but. I love seeing the fact that like all of these people engage with each other as well, like yeah. in my content, my comment section, or like at my book signings. And it's a very kind of like friendly place. And, um, you know, I, I was explaining to somebody recently that I have this interesting mixed bag of people, right? I've got like different ends of the, of the, the political spectrum. You know, I've got like a bunch of different ethnicities. I've, I've got scientists and non-scientists. And so I think continuing to build, I call it the STEM empire. I've like given it a name. I'm like, yes, I love something. that. Long live the STEM empire. Um, so, you know, it's full of all of these really interesting people, like single moms and, you know, lawyers and all these people. And I think that at the end of the day, science really is the grand equalizer, right? Because we are all sort of subject to the objectivity of the world, you know, the funny and the sad and the, you know, amazing and the boring, like we are all subject to this. We all are a part of the same stardust, if we can quote Carl Sagan. And um, so I think really it's kind of harnessing this supportive little micro environment that we've made of people that are just passionate to learn random stuff and just yes. make it bigger and, and continue to expand and continue to connect people who, you know, and, and that's the beauty is like, they're all strangers on the internet and they don't know who they are, but I know who they are. And I'm like, Oh, that really conservative guy is now talking to this really liberal girl and they're bonding over science. That's awesome. Like, and that's amazing. Need, there needs to be more of that in this world. You know what I mean? And like, yeah. I love seeing like them tease out stuff. Somebody will say something antagonistic about something sciencey and then someone else will chime in and be like, well, you know, and then they'll like work it out in the comments. <laughs> and I like literally saw like a love story unfold between people that were going at it at one point. And I was like, and I, I chimed in and I just gave like the eye emoji. <laughs> so I was like, what is happening? But, um, but that's, that's really, I think the only thing that I could ever want is just to make this bigger and to like help harness the power of science to bring people together because we are so divided currently and it's so tragic. And the only way really for us to sort of proliferate as a species is to come together, all of us, like mm -hmm. past country borders, past, you know, religious dogma, et cetera. We all just need to come together and solve big problems. Right. And so hopefully this little microcosm of mine and other science communicators as well, we can sort of make these little bubbles and then maybe the bubbles will merge and we can make larger and larger supportive communities. Yes. Oh gosh. You just stated that so beautifully. And I love that you have such a diverse group of loyal fans. I was listening to um, a Seth Godin interview recently where he was saying, you know, we're not trying to be for everyone. We're trying to be for some or something along those lines. And mm -hmm. I think that that's the thing is, you know, that you're doing something that's meaningful and and successful, you know, objectively successful when you have that type of diversity, the, the perspectives, the people, et cetera, coming in, but joining hands effectively, like it's creating unity among people who, if you put them in a different environment, talking about a different subject, you're going to have a much different outcome. Oh, yes, definitely. Definitely. And I, and I love it. You know, I love seeing like, you know, super conservative, like American flags and eagles and bios talking to people with pride flags. And I'm like, yes, like they, we need more of this. Like, yes, yes. empire. Yes. This yes. is like this little like experiment. I love it because it's working so effectively. And um, so, yeah, I mean, like I said, science is the grand equalizer and on so many fronts. And um, so I challenge, I always like to challenge my colleagues, you know, who, who want to jump into science communication, just be visible. You know, if you're different, if you're marginalized, like it is so important to have you out there and out at the forefront, you know, bringing communities together and bringing in like people that identify with you. And yeah, absolutely. I mean, and 
that's really, I think more and more the way that we have to think about most perspectives. I mean, with science in particular and having the the facts to back it up. Um, one of the my favorite phrases that came from a guest that I'm sure circulates around the world though, is facts over feelings. And I feel like we could learn a lot from that. I mean, your feelings still are important. They matter and that's valid, but also is it rooted in fact? Um, yeah. or because it's not just perceived reality. Of course, of course. Yeah. And I always like to say that, you know, science is not conjecture. Science is not, you know, hyperbole. It is not, uh, you know, opinion. It's not feeling. Science is this grand repository of knowledge that continues to evolve as we discover things as a species. And so, you know, the whole fact versus feeling thing, you know, uh, it's 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 important to to be able to sort of sort through these things, especially on the internet, where you know anybody with a microphone can basically spread misinformation and. Uh, it's, it's a tough battle to fight, but I'm out here. Yeah, with you're like, doing it. <laughs> let's go. You know, I'm like just screaming into the void, hoping it sticks. <laughs> I will say one last thing here, which is that you had, I'd written down a quote uh, from another conversation you had had that you said, I'm not for or against a claim. I'm for the science. And it's, if it's substantiated, I'll change my tune. Absolutely. And I just loved that because I think that's how we as human beings should just operate anyway, is like, if you hear something and you have an opinion or a feeling on it, but you don't know if it's actually the case, like validate that. Cross or, check it. Yeah. It, like what, what harm is there in that? Of course it, there's, there's not. And like, a, again, at its essence, that's what this whole big thing that I'm trying to create is about is showing people that they are every single one of them. You're a scientist go out and find the facts. You hear something, you're like, that seems a little weird. Or, hey, I've been in an echo chamber this whole time and I've held this to be, you know, gospel truth. I maybe should go and fact check this. You're a scientist. We're all scientists at our core. So it's, and you might be surprised. You might be like, oh, wow, that's actually really not the case at all. <laughs> I, I, as much as I think the, my ego detests it, I, when I find that I'm wrong or misinformed and I then gain the proper information, I feel really validated. So it's, you would have to get, you just have to push past that discomfort of being wrong. You know, and I, I feel like as you get older, you embrace that a bit more. Cause I, sure. I felt the same way that you did where I was like, nope, I like to be in an echo chamber. I want my confirmation bias. Like I want to, <laughs> you know, and of course I have that, but I I'm in a, a relatively new relationship and he's a little bit I, like, I would say like right side of moderate. And I am hearing the things that he's saying. And like in the past, I would be like, that's absolutely wrong because I'm like a <laughs> bleeding heart liberal. And then I'm like, you know what? Like some of that, some of that is valid. And even if I don't agree with it, I can understand like wh how you were raised, where you came from. And I, I can get that core of like that logic and that rationale. And it's almost freeing and it's liberating to not be like, to take emotion out of it, not be like, well, that's absolutely crazy. And to actually yeah. have conversations that are like civil and just like un human to human understanding, like, okay, cool. Like I get where you came from. I get where you're coming from with this. And to have another person listen to you it, with the same openness, this is like very refreshing. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know? And to not feel like it's your job to convince somebody or, or for, or to feel like somebody's trying to convince you of things too. I of think course. we get very, very defensive with the mindset of somebody's telling you something. Now you feel like you have to defend yourself. And that might not be the case. Now I'm not sitting here saying roll over, just like accept things that people say, you know, for whatever they, whatever validity they have. But also, as you said, I think that being able to approach those conversations with inherent objectivity, knowing that nobody's trying to make something happen for the other person other than understanding. Yeah. And I think, I think that we could use so much more of that politically. I cannot, I mean, in yes. every capacity, we've become so siloed and everything has become a very like aggressive head versus head kind of thing. And uh, it doesn't need to be. And I've really embraced that as I've gotten older, because I, I mean, I'll admit it. Like, I'm like, if you don't believe in my, you know, like bleeding heart, crunchy surfer girl, <laughs> liberal, liberal <laughs> ideals, you're crazy. You're absolutely yeah. wrong. And nobody's wrong or right. It's just at the end of the day, you know, and I think this is sort of where science comes in. Everybody's just trying to do what they think is right for themselves and their families. And mm. it's predicated on kind of how they were raised and what shaped them and all these different social circles and influences and human behaviors. And um, and it's okay to to listen with an open heart, you know, and I think that we should do more of that, truly. Yeah. 
And it's okay to also listen with an open mind and be willing to change. Like it's, I think we're so scared of change sometimes too, that it's like, Ooh, I, that means I'd have to challenge what I used to believe. And I don't really want to do that. Can't either. do it. Can't do that. <laughs> That sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's it. Right. I mean, cause if you bring it back to the whole, the therapy thing, right. It's like, you have to be ready. You're not going to convince somebody who doesn't want to hear it to hear it. And mm -hmm. so you can only do the best that you can with the information that you've got, whether that's for yourself or anybody else that you're, you're talking to. And I feel like you, you embody that so fully, Leah, this has been one of my absolute favorite conversations. You're such a delight and you're just so just you're so beautifully articulate. I feel like this was you've used multiple words that I'm like, I don't think people speak this way. And it's really <laughs> validating for me because sometimes I think that I, I I have a way of communicating that doesn't necessarily jive with people. And I feel like I was just like we're here and I like it. I got you. Like, yeah, I was, like I said, like I'm picking up what you're throwing down. You know what I mean? Like you, we dropped the word abacus. We knew that there yeah, was yeah. already an instant connection. <laughs> like who's used to that word in centuries. <laughs> so oh no, gosh. it was an absolute delight to be here. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Yeah, absolutely. Gang, you, you should be following Leah wherever you can follow her on TikTok <laughs> and Instagram. It's gnarly by nature. And that's nature with a G similar to gnarly. And we'll put it all in the silent. show notes. Yeah. The G is silent. <laughs> and um, LeahElson.com. So you can find out more about what Leah is doing and check out more of her science career work as well as her book. And you can find There Are No Stupid Questions in Science on Amazon and pretty much wherever else you get books that I've seen. Anywhere books are sold. We might even be in airports around Christmas. So come find me at your local international airport. <laughs> Amazing. That's probably a great airplane read. I feel like that would be an awesome opportunity. Just dive in, yeah, get on the I, plane, come off with so many answers. <laughs> I just wanted to happen because I travel so much. I just want to take like really cheesy pictures next to every book and like hold up lines and make it really inconvenient during the holidays for me. <laughs> yes. I hope I run into you at an airport and this happens. <laughs> doing it. You're like, oh, I know you. Do what you want me to get doing? that for you? That's embarrassing. <laughs> No, no, I would fully support it. I'd be like, can I take it for you? Do you want a video? I love it. I, I feel like you'd get the Scorsese angles too. Like, I feel like you go in on taking pictures. You got that it's vibe. Cinematic mastery. <laughs> oh my gosh. Gang, thank you for joining us, Leah. You've been amazing. And we will catch you all on the flip side. Bye guys. <laughs> Thanks for listening to Who the Fuck. And if you like what you hear, share the show with your friends, family, coworkers, or anyone else you think needs a healthy dose of introspection and raw authenticity. Feel free to rate and review wherever you get your podcasts. It's always appreciated. And you can also visit whothefck.com to keep up to date with what's new in my world and for exclusive bonus content.